Thank you, guys. That still, it still gets me. I, um, yeah, my name is Tim. Um, I'm one of the youth pastors at this church. I, I work at this uh, campus right here with high school and middle school uh, students. Um, and I'm just going to share um, a little bit for the next um, hour or so. No, I'm just, it's a joke. I got it. No, yeah. Um, 45 minutes. Uh, some thoughts on Good Friday. And, uh, you know, Good Friday, I, I was thinking about the other day, Good Friday is probably one of the most neglected, celebrated holidays ever, right? I mean, think about it. Every other holiday has got something, right? I mean, you got Easter, you got bunnies, you got pastels, you got eggs, you got chocolate. Good Friday, what do you have? Nothing, right? You know, Christmas, you got, you got colors. You got red, green, you know, I mean, Christmas got everything. Santa presents, reindeer, things like that. Good Friday, just nothing. I mean, even turkey and for Thanksgiving and orange and New Year's fireworks. Even St. Patrick's Day has got a clover and got green and Valentine's got days of red. What's Good Friday have? I mean, I guess maybe black, but no symbols, right? I mean, actually, even Ash Wednesday, you get a little ash, you know, for in some church, Christian tradition, they put a little ash in Good Friday, you got nothing. I, I noticed that even driving around in, in this area, people got signs, like churches, like our, tur not our church, but other churches have signs for Easter, but there are no signs for Good Friday. Yeah, Good Friday is, has no color themes. It has no sales on Good Friday, no symbols, no cards, no signs. But unfortunately, it's one of the greatest moments in history, one that needs to be remembered in itself because of how much it changes us. And Good Friday, I think, is it changes so much of how we think of ourselves and how we see ourselves in front of God. Good Friday and the cross, it's for me and it's for you. Now, if you're new to church or you're visiting for the first time or maybe or maybe just haven't come enough and really don't know a lot about Good Friday, so a lot of it can seem kind of strange, a lot of it can seem kind of weird, you know, singing about blood and death and stuff like that is, um, but in Christianity, we believe that humans on this earth have a broken relationship with God. And, uh, and there's a lot of different ways that the Bible and Christianity talks about this brokenness. There are different images of, of, of victory over death or victory over a rebellion. Um, but probably one of the most popular ones, a simple one to think of, is that there's a debt that needs to be paid. And then on Good Friday, the cross, it's for me. It's for you. Because the debt has been paid. I don't know if anyone parked behind this, this door here. I did. And um, I brought a bat so that I could go outside and illustrate um, smashing someone's window. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> not smashing anyone's window. But if you could imagine, I took this bat and I walked right outside that door. You might have parked right out there. And I went out there and I smashed that window of your car. Not the front one because that might not, you know, the rebound might hurt me. But one of the sides or backs, and I smashed that window. You probably wouldn't be too happy with me, right? You probably would be, you know, the, you, know you might like me so far, but after that. The relationship, something is broken there. And what if I came to you and I said, you know what, I, I feel bad. I'm sorry. And I'm genuinely sorry. You might forgive me. You might be, oh, well, you know, that's, you know, maybe you had a bad moment. Maybe you had a bad dinner. Maybe you had a bad sermon. I don't know what it is, but you had bad something. And just for a moment, you did something bad. But... There's still something that needs to be paid, right? There's still a window that needs to be repaired. There's still a broken, uh, there may be multiple parts of the car that's broken, and somebody has to pay for that. Well, maybe insurance can pay for some of it. I could pay for some of it. You could pay for somebody, but somebody has to pay for that brokenness. And if you're not sure about Christianity and what this, uh, this is God and sin and rebellion and stuff like that, that's, a, that's one of the starting ways to think about that, that there's something broken 
about your relationship with God for all of us where a debt needed to be paid. And that debt was paid by someone else dying on the cross for you. On Good Friday, the cross, it's for me and it's for you. Uh, you can imagine, you know, we have a lot of different age groups here. We have some people that are seasoned and some people that are younger. Um, <laughs> you can imagine if, a, if you're a more seasoned person. Um, I, someone used that word for me, okay? So that's, that's why, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, some, I was with a bunch of youth pastors and they said, they were talking about, you know, some of the decisions that youth pastors do. And I was like, why would you do that? And they're like, well, when you're seasoned like you, you wouldn't do that. But, you know, us young youth pastors, you know, so if you imagine you're seasoned and maybe, maybe you have a cell phone and you're trying to figure out something on it. And a young person comes along and says, let me help you with that. And says, swipe, you want to change something on your settings, right? So you say, okay, they say, swipe down on it. So you try to swipe, down. and they say, no, no, don't, it's not swipe left, it's not swipe right, it's swipe down. And you say, look for settings. And you say, what settings? And they say to you, well, think back to the days of Leonardo. He believed Leonardo believed that Archimedes had come up with a cogwheel. It looks like a cogwheel. That's what it looks like. And you think, well, you know, I don't know what that is. Eventually, you might do something else. You might say, here, just take my phone and do it for me. Now, if you're a young person, you might think, well, yeah, that's true. Old people, they can't do the stuff, but Pretty much, you know, we can do whatever we want. We're just maybe old people are just holding us back, right? But th imagine this, for every single one of us, there was a time when we were born, there was a time where we could not be fed, or that we did not eat ourselves, that even someone had to physically feed us food. You know, in Christianity and the Bible, we don't talk about it as something where you need the help of someone else. We don't talk about it as you're a, a baby, an infant. In Christianity, we talk about it as that you are dead in that rebellion. That there's absolutely nothing that you can do. That you cannot make any progress on your own towards repairing the relationship, the broken relationship you have with God. You see, Good Friday, the cross is for me and it's for you. And when we have that perspective that Good Friday is for me and for you, that we are so broken that nothing, nothing we can do. We are dead in that. It begins to change us. Now, um, I don't, I, I'm not sure if my, I know my wife was, there this morning or last night. I'm not sure if my kids were there, but I was I actually had a lot of dilemma about what to wear tonight. <laughs> I actually have a uh, jacket in the back, a, a blazer. I have a, I have a cardigan in that room. I have another pair of shoes that is a little more flexible. It's actually the same shoes, it's just different colors. Because I grew up, actually I grew up in a private school. I wore a, a jacket and tie to school every day. And so on Sunday, you know, I dress up for church. That was kind of normal for me. But at a certain point, I started not dressing up for church. And you know, I grew up in a different time maybe than, than some of us, or maybe the same time as some of you, but it's a different time than some of the young people here. So they may not understand it, but some of you may understand that I got a lot of judgment for that. And then also as a, as a pastor, as a, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, you know, like, um, in, and not in California, in a place where, you know, it was just normal that everyone would wear a suit and a tie. It was, you know, even, uh, you know, wearing a jacket without a tie uh, just didn't look right. 
I remember when I came to California, and I moved to California, 2014, I came to California, I came into church. It was the very first Sunday I came to church, not this church, another church in LA. I saw someone wearing flip-flops into church. And I said to myself, well, you know, I know it's California, but come on, church, flip-flops? Uh, no, you know, it's okay if you're wearing flip-flops. Um, but not only did they wear flip-flops, they sat right, you know, I remember, they sat right in the middle aisle, on the uh, an edge seat in the middle aisle, where everyone could see them. I think a second row, everyone could see them. They put, took, and then they took them off. <laughs> Kicked off those flip-flops, barefoot, and shorts, just. And then, I couldn't, I just couldn't believe this. Decided to pull their legs up and sit cross-legged. The, on the pew. I was like, bare feet? Take off the sandals and then bring your, your feet up there? This is church. Right? I mean, it was a culture shock for me. It was very difficult. When we understand at the cross that we are that broken, that we would need someone to die for us, why is it that we have these kind of thoughts? That we judge? I mean, sometimes we, I mean, we may actually judge people, but oftentimes we just do it in our head, right? Right? We often make these judgments about people. And not just the way they dress, the way they act, the things they say, the type of things that they do, the type of friends that they have, the things that they choose to participate in. Now, I'm not saying that anything goes and you can do whatever you want and, you know, God doesn't care. Of course, there are wise decisions to be made. There are appropriate things to, to do and say and dress and things like that. But I think that an attitude from our heart that judges other people forgets that the cross and Good Friday, it's for me and it's for you. Because only someone who felt better about himself could look at someone else and say, don't put, don't put your feet up on that chair, or don't use those kind of words, or don't have those kind of views, or don't be that kind of person without love, without grace, but in judgment. See, when we recognize that the cross is for me, it is for you, there's a lot more grace. If we think the cross is for us generically or is for other people, right? I've got my stuff together. You know, we can, we can have those kind of thoughts. But when we recognize that the cross, it's for me, it's for you, it's a lot harder. It's a lot more discernment in speaking truth and love. There's a lot more grace. There's a lot more humility. On Good Friday, the cross is for me, it's for you. Uh, about a week ago on, this, uh, on YouTube, a short came up and um, it, for those of you who don't know, it's a uh, short is a short video, I guess. It's a, it's a short, you know, 20 second video in, in portrait mode on, on YouTube. And uh, a short came up, and I don't even know who it was or what it was or how it came up, but it was just a, a simple, it was simply a person on there, um, and, and I think she was saying something along the lines of, um, when are you gonna realize you are enough? And I thought, I, I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to realize, you know, click on this ad. No, that's not, there was no ad. But this theme is very popular today, is it not, right? We see this kind of idea on t-shirts, we see it on, on, on mugs, we see it on, on, on videos, it's a theme in movies, it's a theme in music. You look around the culture and, and you look for this, you'll see it everywhere, this idea that you are enough. And actually, I, I agree with that. I agree that you are enough just the way you are. Now, I also agree that God calls you to a certain life and wants you to grow as in, in all sorts of ways. 
but fundamentally that you are accepted by God because of his grace, because of his forgiveness and your confession. But I think in our culture, this idea that you are enough, this idea that you know you are loved, you are beautiful, you are accepted just the way you, you know, we're all equal. I really think that some at some point people are gonna wake up. We're gonna wake up as a society, as a culture, and we're gonna realize these are empty promises. That this promise and this message that we're being taught has no foundation. Uh, I grew up in an area not with a lot of Asians. And not only were there not a lot of Asians, but there was a lot of um, discrimination and racism and things like that. And, you know, I, I would face, uh, and I was also small for my age, I guess, or, you know, small, so small and an Asian. And I was also a Christian, and there's a lot of minority things going on. And I got, I would say I got picked on a lot. Um, and thinking back, if I were to tell my younger self, going through these years, through these difficulties, you are enough. You are, you know, you are beautiful. You are loved. You are you're great just the way you are. It might feel good for a little bit, but it has to be based on something. Many, many people in this room, I'm sure, have faced difficult things. Maybe today, maybe this week maybe this month. And it's, it's, not, it's not a competition or comparison of who's faced the most difficult things. But I have a friend who's a pastor, probably in his early, early 50s, a little bit older than me. He has six kids. The youngest is a, a senior in high school. Uh, four of the kids are biological, two of them are adopted. The adopt, one of the adopted, he's, a, he's not Asian, one of his adopted kids is Asian. The other one is disabled, and his, he and his wife chose to adopt them. He's a pastor of a small church here in, a, in um, Escondido. And two weeks ago, his wife passed away from cancer. She was 52. She had, um, I think it was breast cancer, and, uh, about 10 years ago, it went away and then it came back and it was stage four very quickly, I think just a few years ago. Passed away and he's absolutely broken. You think so someone who's given his life to God and to ministry and to helping other people know God, who's adopted kids from difficult circumstances, who's Raise them. Actually, I, I, how I know him, I actually teach parenting classes with him. Someone who does those kind of things, why God would allow that kind of thing. You can go to him and you can say, You're loved, you're enough. It's going to be okay. But those are empty promises if you don't believe what he also believes. If you don't believe what I also believe. If you don't believe what I'm telling you right now today is that the cross on Good Friday is for me and it's for you. As awful as the cross is, that you are so broken that someone needed to die for you. As wonderful as the cross is, that God loved and loves and will always love you. That the cross is for you. 
You were loved first by God. That's what the Bible tells us. That Good Friday and the cross is for you. That's the good news. We hear this all the time. So don't let me, don't let me, don't let me down. You can count on me like one, two, three, I'll be there. But how would you know that? How would you know? You would know because of what has been done on the cross. This, you know, if as much as you are humbled by the cross, knowing that Jesus has died for you, that there's someone had to die for you, you are also empowered by the cross when you know that God did this for you, that he demonstrated this for you, that in this way, God loved the world. You and I can leave tonight, can go from this place in Good Friday with a humility and a confidence that the world cannot understand. When you recognize that Good Friday, the cross is for me, it's for you, you will be more humble than anyone. But at the same time, you are more confident than most people around you. On Good Friday, the cross is for me, it's for you. It can change us when we recognize both our brokenness and God's love for us. I'm going to read a story about Jim Cimbala. Some of you, you know, uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle, some of you just... That means absolutely nothing. Some of you, you know, you, you remember this from 500, uh, 150 years ago. Um, as Jim Simbala tells this story about himself on one Easter year. He tells this story, it was Easter Sunday, and Easter Sunday, and he was, he was preaching, and he was so tired at the end of the day, I just went to the edge of the platform, pulled down my tie, sat down, and draped my feet over the edge. It was a wonderful service with so many people coming forward to accept Christ. The counselors were talking with these people and I was sitting there and I looked up the middle aisle and there in about the third row, there was a man who looked about 50 years old, disheveled, filthy. He looked up at me rather sheepishly as if saying, could I talk to you? Now, we have homeless people coming in all the time asking for money or whatever. So I, as I sat there, I said to myself, though I'm ashamed of it, what a way to end a Sunday. I've had such a good time preaching and ministering. Here's a fellow probably wanting some money for more alcohol. And this man, he walked up. When he got within about five feet of me, I smelled a horrible smell like I'd never smelled in my life. It was so awful that when he got close, I would inhale by looking away, and then I'd talk to him, and then look away to, to, to inhale, because I couldn't inhale facing him. I asked him, what's your name? David. How long have you been on the streets? Six years. How old are you? 32. He looked 50. Hair matted, front teeth miss missing, eyes slightly gazed. Where did you sleep last night, David? Abandoned truck. Now, this is Simbala speaking. I keep in my back pocket a money clip that also holds some cash. I fumbled to pick some out, thinking I would give him some money. I won't even get a volunteer to help here. They're all busy talking to other people. Usually we don't give money to people. We get them something to eat, and we would take them out to eat. But he took the money out. David pushed his finger in front of me. He said, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus, the one you were just talking about, because I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die on the street. I completely forgot about David, and I started to weep for myself. I was going to give a couple of dollars to someone God has sent to me. 
See how easy it is? I could have made the excuse that I was tired. There is no excuse. I was not seeing him the way God sees him. I was not feeling the way God feels, but oh, did that change. David just stood there. He didn't know what was happening. But I pleaded with God, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry to represent you this way. I'm sorry. Here I am with my messages and my points, my church and my sermon. You send someone to me and I am not ready for it. And Simbala closes with this. He says, something came over me. Suddenly I started to weep deeper and David began to weep. He fell against my chest as I was sitting there. He fell against my white shirt and tie and I put my arms around him and we wept for each other. The smell of his person became a beautiful aroma. Here is what I thought the Lord made real to me. If you don't love this smell, I can't use you because this is why I called you where you are. This is what you are about. You are about this smell. Christ changed David's life. He became a Christian. He memorized portions of scripture that were incredible. He found a place to live. They hired him to do maintenance at the church. Got his teeth fixed. Detoxed him. Six days. He spent Thanksgiving at Jim Simbala's house. He also spent Christmas at his house. He was so poor when they were exchanging presents. He pulled out a little thing and said, this is all I have, a little white handkerchief. It's the only thing that he could afford. About a year later, David got up and talked about his conversation and his conversation with Christ. The minute he took the mic and began to speak, Jim Simbala said, this man is a preacher. They ordained David and he became a pastor at a church in New Jersey. And Jim Simbala was so close to saying, just take this money. I'm a busy pastor, I'm a busy Christian. Tonight, Whatever place you are in your life, whatever you're doing, whatever relationships you have, families and friends and coworkers and classmates, would you consider the Good Friday and the cross? It's for me. It's for you. And would that humble you and also give you the confidence to go out Share the gospel and make a difference in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are humbled by the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the immense love demonstrated through his willing obedience to lay down his life for us. May the significance of this day be etched on our hearts, striving us to reflect deeply on the depth of your love and the magnitude of Christ's sacrifice. May we never take for granted the precious gift of salvation that was purchased with his blood. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.